Chang'e 6 mapped lunar water behavior on the moon's far side. New in situ readings show differences between sun-worked surface grains and freshly exposed subsurface finds, plus a daily swing bottoming at local noon. This video explains how the lander's plume created an experiment, the key numbers, and how upcoming missions can tap fine near-surface regolith with lighter hardware and smarter timing. Chang'e 6 transformed its touchdown on the moon's far side into a live experiment on lunar water. As the lander descended into the South Pole, Aitken Basin, its engine plumes swept aside the very top layer of dust and grit, briefly exposing the shallow subsurface. That moment created a tidy, side-by-side -side comparison zone. Undisturbed, sun-worked surface grains right next to freshly exposed, cooler finds just below. Instruments then scanned both patches over local time, measuring hydration and temperature as the surface warmed toward lunar noon. The results are crisp and memorable. At the surface, grains averaged about 105 parts per million of water, measured as OH slash H2O. In the freshly exposed shallow subsurface finds, the average was about 76 parts per million. This depth contrast, paired with a clear daily rhythm, Hydration dipping toward local noon shows that water at the very top of the lunar soil is not static. It accumulates during cooler periods and partially escapes or migrates when heated, creating a real, observable cycle in the upper centimeters. Equally important, the patterns line up with how the soil is built. Variations in hydration correlate with the abundance of glassy regolith, with grain size and with depth. Finer particles offer more surface area for hydrogen to stick. Glassy coatings can host implanted hydrogen more readily, and slightly deeper material, when freshly exposed, can show lower average hydration than the work surface. Because the disturbed and undisturbed patches sit under identical lighting and composition, this setup acted like a controlled A-B test at centimeter scales, something rovers or orbiters rarely achieve so cleanly. Context makes the measurements even more valuable. The South Pole, Aitken Basin is the Moon's largest and among its oldest impact structures, providing a geologically rich target. Chang'e 6 is also the first mission to return far-side samples, delivering nearly 2 kilograms of material to Earth for lab analysis. The governing story is a duet between the solar wind and constant micrometeorite gardening. The solar wind supplies a steady stream of protons that bond with oxygen in lunar minerals to form OH slash H2O on grain surfaces. Meanwhile, micrometeorites melt, fracture, and churn the soil, creating glassy droplets, fresh surfaces, and mixed layers. The outcome is a patchwork of sites where hydrogen can bind more or less easily. Chang'e 6's readings let us watch that process in action and quantify how strongly the upper centimeters hold on to hydration through a lunar day. Start with depth. The freshly exposed shallow subsurface finds averaged around 76 ppm, while the sun-worked surface averaged about 105 ppm. That suggests surface processing can enhance detectable hydration relative to just below surface material, up to the point where heating starts to drive it away. Then comes time of day. As temperatures rise toward local noon, Hydration drops to a minimum, indicating that a portion of the water is weakly bound and mobile. By late afternoon and into the cooler night, some of that hydration can return or reaccumulate, completing the daily cycle. Texture and composition sharpen the picture. Areas richer in glassy regolith can host more implanted hydrogen. Finer grains provide greater surface area, and microfractures increase the number of binding sites. Each of these factors nudges the balance of how much OH slash H2O sticks versus how much is released as temperatures swing. Add illumination and shadowing across tiny topography, and you get a mosaic of hydration states shifting through the day. Cross-site comparisons reinforce the point that lunar water is not a single number, but a behavior. The far side landing area investigated here shows, on average, roughly twice the hydration scene at a prior near-side site known for weaker readings. If the goal is to use lunar water soon, early efforts should target what's easiest to access with minimal hardware and power. These findings point to the fine-grained, near-surface regolith as the most practical starting point. 
If tens to a hundred plus parts per million reside in the top few centimeters and vary predictably with temperature, you can design compact systems that gently heat or vacuum process small batches of fines, capture the released vapor, and concentrate it without deep drilling or heavy augers. That shrinks mass, lowers complexity, and reduces risk for the first demonstrations. Timing becomes a tool, not a constraint. Because hydration dips around local noon and strengthens during cooler periods, operations can be scheduled to favor windows when water release is most efficient. Site selection also becomes smarter. You target micro terrains with favorable grain sizes and higher glass content, where the odds of stronger hydration signals, and therefore better yield per watt, are higher. Think of it as precision agriculture for regolith. Small plots, tune processes, and tight control over when and how you harvest. This science slots neatly into the coming mission sequence. A reconnaissance mission can map volatile rich microenvironments, track how hydration changes through a lunar day, and identify promising hot spots within a landing ellipse. A follow-on mission can run true in situ resource utilization trials, bake finds in a controlled chamber, measure release curves, test condensers, and validate storage. From there, it's a matter of scaling up with modular heaters and condensers, optimizing power cycles to align with local illumination, and integrating the water loop with oxygen production for habitats and, eventually, propellant. Long-term base planning benefits just as much. Water isn't only for drinking. Split into hydrogen and oxygen, it supports life support systems, radiation shielding strategies, and potential fuel depots for landers or orbital tugs. These measurements turn a vague promise, there's water on the moon, into engineering criteria. Choose fine-grained terrains with the right textures, operate away from the local noon minimum, and design systems that naturally ride the lunar thermal cycle instead of fighting it. In practical terms, this reduces uncertainty for power budgets, thermal control, storage sizing, and logistics. It's the difference between hoping a resource exists and knowing when, where, and how to tap it. Chang'e 6 didn't just confirm water, it showed how it behaves, varying with grain size, depth, and time of day, and concentrating in fine, near-surface regolith that's genuinely accessible. That turns exploration into engineering. Pick the right microsites, schedule around local noon lows, and design lightweight systems to warm, capture, and store vapor from finds. With that playbook, the next missions can move beyond finding to using, supporting crews, closing life support loops, and laying the groundwork for a sustainable polar foothold. If we get this right, the moon stops being a destination and starts becoming infrastructure. Thanks for watching. Your curiosity keeps this journey going. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more updates on space exploration and scientific discoveries, and don't forget to leave a comment below. Also, you can visit our website, spaceinews.com. Thank you for watching, and see you next time.